Greetings, this is Pastor Trish from Messiah Lutheran Church in North Mankato, Minnesota, and I want to welcome you to our worship service for Sunday, October 18th. Uh, we will be uh, thinking about our stewardship uh, pledge drive, and that has begun. For those of you who are Messiah members, you should have received your pledge card and information in the mail, and we ask that you return your pledge for 2021 by November 8th. And so we will be talking just a little bit about that today. I also encourage you to stay tuned to the weekly emails that we send out to Facebook and to our website for information and updates as the weather is now changing. We want to keep you informed as decisions are made and as we make changes to some of our protocols that we've had in place over the summer. So invite you to simply stay tuned to those different types of uh, communications so that you can be aware of what's happening. You'll also find in those places just some of the many things that are happening here at Messiah these days. With that, we will begin our worship today and we begin with a confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us take a moment and confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears our cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. We'll continue with a song. Oh, 
with our prayer of the day. Sovereign God, raise your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is a psalm. It is Psalm 96, verses 1 through 9. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless the name of the Lord. Proclaim God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations and God's wonder among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods and the nations, they are but idols. But you, O Lord, have made the heavens. Majesty and magnificence are in your presence. Power and splendor are in your sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due to the holy name. Bring offerings and enter the courts of the Lord. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before the Lord, all the earth. And our gospel reading for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. And then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I've got uh, some dimes here. You can, you can see them a little bit. And uh, if you're like me, I don't look at them very often. I simply pull them out of my purse and I use them. But we, of course, have the face of someone on our American coins. And on a dime, it's the face of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We all know, of course, whose face is on a penny, right? It's Abraham Lincoln. How about the nickel? Do you know who's on the nickel? Thomas Jefferson. And that quarter, most people I think remember who's on our quarter. Of course, that would have been our first president, George Washington. Well, if you are a young person and you are watching this recording with uh, a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa right now, I want you to remember this. The next time you see me in church, you come up to me and say, Pastor Trish, 
I know who's on that dime and I would like a dime and I will give you one. How does that sound? I've got a handful here that I want to be able to give out to the young people. At any rate, the other reason I am talking about these coins today is that when we think about what Jesus asked of the Pharisees and the Herodians and the question he posed for them, he asked to see a coin that's used to pay tax. In other words, asked to see some of their money. And on their coin was a picture, a stamped image of Caesar. And not only that, it said something to the effect of Caesar as Lord or Caesar as God. That, that, use of money would be the equivalent for us today to have a coin, a dime or a quarter or whatever, but a coin stamped with the image of President Trump. Or when President Obama was the president, it would have had the image of President Obama on it. So it would be like having it stamped with the image of our current leader. Now, if you are uh, a backer or supporter of President Trump, you might think that's just fine. But if you disagree with President Trump on some things, you might not like having to use money with the image of someone with whom you disagree on it. And the same thing, of course, would have been true when President Obama was in office. If you supported him, you would have been okay with it. And if you were a detractor from him, you would not probably have been okay with it. Not just that, though, but it also would say something to the effect of not just president, but Lord or God. And as people of faith, we know that we would likely all find that offensive. And that's really what those folks living in the first century in the Roman Empire were dealing with. This was a political issue and a religious issue. Not only were they made to pay tax to an empire that they perhaps disagreed with, but the leaders of that empire considered themselves to be divinely chosen, to be one and the same as Israel's God. And of course, the people of Israel understood their God to be very, very different than a plain old Caesar or president or an earthly king of any kind. And so I just invite you to keep that in mind as we heard that story about Jesus saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. We're going to talk now a little bit more about that. So I want you to think for a moment about children still in general. And uh, one of the things we know about kids is they can throw pretty good temper tantrums, right? It's a fact of life. All children do that at some point, uh, at many points in their formative years. Kids throw temper tantrums and it's because they, they want something or it's not just a want for them. They feel that they have to have whatever that is before them or not have something done to them. Sometimes the case the case is the temper tantrum goes that way. But often it's something like, I just need to have that candy bar that's at the checkout. Or I need to be able to watch 15 more minutes of this TV show or have 15 more minutes of screen time or, or whatever it is. What happens in a temper tantrum is they've got something right in front of their face and that's their focus. And that's all they can see. That's all they can think about. That's their entire reality in that moment is that one thing, whether it's an object or a situation or a, a request or a command, whatever it is, it's right in front of them. And that's all they can focus on and see. And they get caught up in this reality that's pretty nearsighted. They can't see beyond it to calm down and, and to think rationally or reasonably about any of it. I'm not sure if we as adults outgrow our temper tantrums, what do you think? Now we might not throw ourselves on the floor anymore, screaming and yelling and crying, but I can't help but think that the ways in which we are being so nasty to one another these days isn't a form of a temper tantrum, especially the way it happens on social media. We do know how to get angry. We do know how to yell perhaps pout in order to get our way. 
we might argue that our temper tantrums really just get more sophisticated over time. We become more manipulative, for example. Or our temper tantrums might also be masked, not as anger, but as worry or anxiety or we fret. No matter how old we are, all of us can get nearsighted in just seeing and being concerned only about that thing that's in front of us at the moment. And right now there's a lot that's in our way and that's making us nearsighted. It might be the election, it might be the pandemic, and for some of us it's other kinds of issues. Issues like a relationship that's not going the right way, or um, a child who's acting out in a way that worries us, or we're worried about our finances, or whatever it is, all sorts of things in our lives right now are competing for our attention and they consume us to the extent that we, we just can't seem to see anything else. And much of what is facing us right now are things we don't like, things we'd rather not have to deal with, things we wish that would go away, things we want to be different. And so it leads to our temper tantrums of anger or fear or worry or manipulation or, or however it is that we deal with that nearsighted picture. But what we hear in our scripture reading today is this call that says, stop, stop and remember. God's greater than that. Stop this nearsighted focus. Take a deep breath, right? Hang on a minute, just stop and move your head. Look the other way, look away from whatever is consuming you and look beyond that. Take your eyes off whatever seems to be monstrous in this moment and look and see. When you look and see, you see God's greater than all of this. God is so much more than however big this seems. God's greater than that. Jesus is saying to the, to the Pharisees and to the Herodians, sure, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Sure, take care of this. But more than that, look at what belongs to God and give that to God. Yes, there are taxes that have to be paid to the empire, whether we are okay with that or not. Do what we have to do, but remember, all of that is small com potatoes compared to God's goodness in God's greatness. Focus on that instead. God's great, greater than any Caesar or president or, or congressman. Just like God is greater than our knowledge of science. God is greater than our kindest selves. God is greater than our largest threat. Focus on that. Whatever is consuming you in this moment, the election, money, relationships, illness, loneliness, pressures of every kind, God is greater than all of it. Way back in the season of Epiphany, if my memory serves me correctly, we, set, we spent a few weeks talking about the greatness of God. I have a, a star that's been taped to my printer in my office all this time, and what I wrote on there was, God is greater than that. And this week, I was reminded of that truth again as I heard Jesus say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what belongs to God and remember how great our God is. Now, after Jesus says that to the Pharisees and the Herodians, did you hear what happened right after that? Scripture says when they heard this, they were amazed. Amazed. Amazed, perhaps, in the way that Jesus turned their nearsightedness into something much bigger. It moved them away from their temper tantrum of, who are you going to give your allegiance to, to realizing that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the greatness of God, the goodness of God, the mercy and majesty and justice and faithfulness and grace of God, all of that is bigger than our biggest problem, greater than our greatest fear. All of that deserves our focus. All of that is the relentless love of God. 
God, pursuing the ones that God loves, God's overwhelming care of the smallest and most insignificant of us, God's promise to us to bring about God's kingdom on this earth, all of that relentless grace, relentless justice and mercy, that's what deserves our focus. And all of that should stun us into silence, into amazement, should turn us speechless as it did to the Pharisees and the Herodians. All of that is God's lasered, relentless focus on you, God's beloved, the one that God is never going to leave, never desert, never give up on. Focus on that. Focus on God's relentless love of you. And then, then give to God what belongs to God. What does that mean? Well, this is supposed to be a stewardship sermon as we kick off our pledge drive. So of course it means looking at our finances and thinking about what it is that God has called us to steward, to care for. But I also want you to remember that generosity doesn't begin with your pocketbook. Our generous response to God's relentless love comes when we realize just how relentless God is. When we learn to embrace and allow ourselves to experience God's greatness. When we have come to understand that no matter who we are, no matter what we have or haven't done, no matter how big our temper tantrum or worry or doubt or anything else, when we understand that no matter what, we are loved with a never ending love that is greater than all of the greatest things we could possibly imagine, then, then we will be able to not help but respond with generosity. And a generous response includes our money, but it also includes every atom of our being, every word, every action, every thought, every breath. This is what it means to give to God what belongs to God. In my study this week, I came across a poem. It's an anonymous Celtic poem, and it was called, I Am Bending My Knee. I took the liberty of adapting it. I'm going to pray it now, and I invite you to pray it with me. I am bending my knee in the eye of the Father who created me, in the eye of the Son who purchased me, in the eye of the Spirit who cleansed me. In this posture of prayer, in this moment of need, I ask for the love of God, the affection of God, the smile of God, the wisdom of God, the grace of God, the will of God. I ask so that I might do, do unto the world of God, to do and to show, to act and to be God's love, God's affection, God's smile, God's wisdom, God's grace. God's will. In this moment, in all my moments, may I respond generously to God's relentless love. Amen. We continue with song.
continue our service now with the prayers of the church. Your response to the petition, Lord, in your mercy, can be hear our prayer. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among people of faith everywhere as we give of ourselves for the sake of your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of praise, all creation declares your name. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may the whole universe show forth your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling trust. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt. We remember especially those we now name in our hearts. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, we offer you our prayers of grief, and we sing to you our prayers of gratitude. We cling to your mercies as you accompany us during these times of difficulty and perplexity, and we offer our thanks and praise for points of joy and clarity in our midst. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just a moment to say thank you for your ongoing um, offerings that go toward the, the ministry of, of this community and some of the things that are happening, um, both your monetary offerings as well as your offerings of time and um, in-kind offerings that you have been giving uh, warm clothing, items for the food shelf, and school supplies for the Boys and Girls Club here in the Mankato area. And so thank you for the many ways in which you are giving of yourself. If you would like to uh, give an offering to the church, you may do so uh, mailing in or dropping off uh, an offering as well as um, uh, through our website, you'll find something online as well. So uh, a prayer of thanksgiving. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We are now moving into Holy Communion and uh, my apologies, I forgot to let you know that at the beginning of this service. So I would invite you to pause this video for a moment and go and uh, find elements so that you might join, we might join together in receiving this sacrament. We do so across time and space, but uh, grab a piece of bread, a piece of toast or a cracker, a juice or wine or whatever you have to drink, and then come back and we will continue with, with Holy Communion. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broken, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. Gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you take and eat the uh, bread that is before you, and as you drink the cup that is before you, know that this is the body and the blood of Christ. It has been given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen.
one more, just a little announcement. If you are worshiping regularly with us from home and would like a prepackaged uh, communion elements that we are using here in person, you are welcome. We are happy to share these with you. Just call our church office and we can make arrangements for you to have those elements available as you worship with us each week. Receive now the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we conclude our service with a song. <laughs>